Okay, this is the Silt versus Role Playing Game Writing Contest Workshop, Writing Workshop number one. In this workshop, we are going to be focusing mostly on faith sheets, which is one of the submission tracks for the writing contest. Uh, we'll also have a short uh, little bit at the end for journey scenes. Uh, journey scenes are fairly small and pretty open-ended, so we, we don't have too much to talk about there, uh, but we, we do have some things to share there as well. The way this is going to go is the first hour, roughly, is going to be a discussion of what I call the creative writing elements of the faith sheet, so the introduction, the names, the altar, uh, the verse of prophecy. Uh, I will have some remarks that'll take about 10 minutes or so, and then we are going to break into groups to do a writing exercise for for, uh, for that part of the workshop. Um, part of what we want to do here for this workshop, especially with the writing exercises, is mostly just a chance to like, kind of practice some of these things that I'm talking about, but also to get some feedback on what you write right now for the workshop. You may also have questions specifically about your entry, and I'm uh, happy to answer those, especially if your question slots in nicely with what I've just talked about in the outline. Um, I'm also going to reserve about 30 minutes or so after the scheduled time to hang around and just specifically answer your questions about your entries. So if you have like, um, so if you have a question about say, oh, I wrote this move and I'm not sure if it works or, oh, I'm not sure if this verse of prophecy makes any sense. I'm happy to, at the, at the end, to like talk with you in, in more specific detail, whoever wants to hang around at the end. I'm also available in DMs as well, uh, especially today. I've kind of really set aside today for this. So, um, but yeah, so the first thing, we'll be doing this sort of creative writing bit. Then we have a little writing component after that. Uh, for the second hour-ish of the uh, workshop, we will be doing the moves workshop, where we'll talk about the starting move, uh, writing additional moves, uh, some general thoughts about moves, move structures, and things like that. Uh, we will then break off into the same groups again to continue writing, uh, this time writing moves and things. We will also talk about in that section uh, the final prayer component of the faith sheet, and we will also have a final prayer writing component in the second writing component, writing portion. And then we will wrap up the workshop with essentially journey scenes at that point. Um, I'll have some things I'm going to say about journey scenes. I'm going to talk about paint the scene and recall a time. I know Gabriel has some stuff he wants to talk about with regards to journey scenes. And then uh, there's no writing component for the journey scenes uh, for the workshop. Uh, but with whatever time we have left after our remarks, we'll just open it up to questions generally, either about journey scenes or anything to do that with the workshop up to that point, or your specific entries as well. Um, after my remarks for the first two halves, or for the first two sections, I will kind of open it up to questions uh, about what I just talked about. Uh, but I do want to kind of break into the writing component pretty quickly, if, I, if we can. So that's sort of my thinking there. Um, so with all that said, just general uh, things. If you have a question, if there's something specifically you want to chime in about in the middle of uh, my talking or somebody else talking, uh, do the little hands up thing on Zoom. Uh, that's the easiest thing for me to pay attention to while we're doing this. And if you are not talking at any point in the uh, workshop, please just stay on mute so that we don't get any background noise or anything from you. And so with all that said, we're going to start with the faith sheet. And here I'm going to recommend that you have some faith sheets pulled open. I'm going to be referring to all of the core faith sheets that come with the game, uh, but I'm really going to be, most of my examples come from the St. Electric, if that helps, if you want to just kind of have that one at the ready. But for the most part, I'll be kind of bouncing around the faith sheets for examples and things. But I want to talk about the portion of the faith sheet that I call the creative writing portion, which is the names of the god, the introduction section of the faith sheet, uh, the altar section of the faith sheet, and the verse of prophecy. Now, to some degree, uh, these parts of the faith sheet are simply creative writing, and there's not a whole lot we can go over in this workshop that will help you be a better creative writer. Um, for purposes of the contest, it is your best opportunity to get points on that creativity and writing quality uh, 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 criteria that they're going to be judged on. So just kind of keep that in mind. If you are just here to write, you know, to get inspiration or techniques for writing face sheets just generally because you're interested in doing homebrew or your own publications, um, 
understand that like a big part of this section of the faith faith sheet is just is how well it's written and how vivid it is and how evocative and so um i always think it's best just to get people's input like what do you think of this does this sound cool does it read cool does it is it is it neat um does it make sense that kind of thing um the key thing when you're thinking about these portions of the faith sheet i think is that they should tell us something about the god and the custodian the players and the keeper when they play the silt versus role-playing game they don't have the benefit of a three thousand word lore book entry for your particular faith right all they really have to go on is what's written on the faith sheet it's a fairly compact space that small constrained space actually serves the gameplay in a really important way because in tsv and indeed in all Carp from Brindlewood games, the players and keepers are invited to create their version of the faith in their campaign, right? And so your job then when you're writing the faith sheet is to essentially give players the basics of what the faith is about and perhaps even more importantly, to inspire that creativity and that collaborative world building that players and playgroups will do once they have the faith sheet in their hand. Talking about each individual section, uh, names. Obviously, there needs to be an overall name of the faith. Uh, what do people generally call the faith? The Saint Electric, the Pox Martyr, and so forth. There should be three or four alternate names. You'll notice on the faith sheet that under each of the main headings uh, of the titles, there's three or four little alternate God names. This section uh, doesn't seem like much on the page. Indeed, it's a very small physical part of the faith sheet. It is, however, massively important uh, for both world building and for uh, inspiring players, as I mentioned, that's an important thing. It These little alternate names give the God a sense of history. They give a sense of the God being worshipped more widely than just the custodian. These alternate names should be vivid. They should paint a picture in a few words. They should be suggestive, but they don't need to make perfect sense, nor do they have to be explained. This is a really, really important part. I want to direct your attention, I think, to... Let's take a look at the St. Electric. If you click over to the St. Electric or scroll over to it in your PDF, you see that the St. Electric has the alternate names, Maiden of the Caged Sun, Madam Light, the Blazing Martyr, the Neon Messiah. I love those four alternate names because they're all suggestive of something. They're suggestive of heat. They're suggestive of electricity. They're suggestive of, in the Neon Messiah, of like electric uh, signs or like, you know, or signage and things like that. But they don't necessarily explain anything. They don't necessarily mean much. They they are kind of like a wide open sort of canvas on which players and keeper can kind of can kind of build on, right? Like the 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 introduction of the Saint Electric talks a little bit about her history in the setting, but in general, we don't know why the Saint Electric is considered the blazing martyr. We don't know why she is a maiden, you know, caged. Uh, in sun or whatever, right? Like we we don't know the reason for those things, um, but but there's a suggestion there, right? It's just something to think about. So again, there's this idea of the alternate names kind of inspiring this wide open kind of collaborative world building and role play. So that's sort of a, a major function they serve, and that's what you should be thinking about when you're making them. You might consider giving them a folkloric quality. I think that. Having a folkloric quality fits nicely with the themes of the game, the genre that the game plays around in. Um, some of the alternate names, for example, are old. Like I think the Cairn Maiden is called like Old Soil Mouth, right? Like uh, that's, a, that's a very folkloric kind of thing. Uh, he of or she of, he of this, she of that. Uh, Mister. Um, these are all like kind of folklore sorts of things, and so I, um, and so I think that that's something to, to that that's an approach that you can take. Uh, I just got to note that my mic is a bit close. Am I do I still sound kind of close, or should I move it back? Is that good? 
just keep letting me better, know. Yep. Yeah, keep letting me know if it's too if it's too uh, too plosivy. Okay, so alternate names. The next part is the introduction. The introduction is your best opportunity to tell us about this god. It's usually written in the second person as if the custodian is being addressed. This is not required, uh, but unless there is some thematically interesting reason why you would want to write it in the first or third person, I wouldn't deviate from that, especially for contest purposes. Uh, as a general matter for, uh, for contest purposes, you should probably you should probably stick to the established format um, within with a couple of exceptions where creativity where there's an opportunity to really like creatively shine but for something like this for the introduction i recommend keeping it in the second person but your god might have a reason why it would be written in first person like maybe your god is a god of like hard-boiled crime novels or something and so you want to write in the first person as if you were the narrator of a hard-boiled crime novel like something like that would be kind of fun uh but as uh as a general matter that's sort of um you know it's probably best to keep it in the second person the introduction is your chance to show off your writing chops for contest purposes I do think you want to swing big here. I do think you want to be really vivid and descriptive, but you do also need to make it understandable. Again, ask someone to read this for you uh, before you submit, have someone read it and just make sure it makes sense. I find a lot of times in creative writing and, and especially in game writing, you something lives in your head and is perfectly understandable in a certain way because you've been living with it, but but because of that, you have blind spots and there's things that you're not, you're forgetting to explain to the reader because, because they, they don't have all the context that you have. And so def definitely have somebody read your introduction just to make sure that at a basic level, it's, it's understandable. But do your best to be like, to, 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 to be vivid in your descriptions and your writing. Like you, it, it's, the interesting thing about the space and the introduction is it's a fairly short space, but a lot happens there, right? Like, like again, you have to tell a lot of lore. You have to tell us a lot about your God in a fairly short space. It's an interesting creative constraint. Some things you might want to focus on. At a basic level, what is the God's sphere of influence? Like, what are they the God of? If the God physically manifests in the setting, what does that look like? Like, is it a, do they have a physical form like the Karen Maiden? Do they, are they like, are there prayer stamps all over all the, you know, like all over things like the St. Electric and all of her appliances, right? Like what is the, what is the, the physical representation of the God? Um, maybe some notes about the God's history. Is, word, is the worship of the God widespread or is it very local? Is it say the St. Electric versus the Trawler Man, right? Um, what are the practical applications or implications of worshiping this God. This is really important for the silt verses as a setting, right? We don't care necessarily, we don't care as much about like, you know, the, the particular granular details of worship and faith as much as we care about how that faith expresses itself in a practical way, right? So the St. Electric, Yes, she has all this incredible history that's implied anyway of, you know, being like an ancient fire goddess. But nowadays, she's the goddess whose prayer mark is stamped on your on your Vitamix and your, you know, and and your and and your your KitchenAid mixer, right? Like 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 that's the practical implication of this god's existence and this and the worship of this god. So think about things like that. Um, an optional thing but strongly recommended for contest purposes. Where does the custodian fit in? What's their relationship to this faith right now at the start of the game? Most of the official faith sheets talk about the God in, with some of these things that I've noted, but they also talk about you, the custodian, and where you're at right now. So that's another thing you might consider. All of these things are just optional. Like these are just things to think about when you're thinking about what to what to focus on in your introduction. I do think though at a basic level you should tell us what what they're the god of and how how they manifest and what the practical applications of their worship are. I think those are probably the really key the key bits there. 
I'm going to circle back for questions in a minute, but I see that some are going into the chat, so I'll do my best to revisit those in a moment. Let me finish my notes real quick. Um, altars. Like the alternate god names, uh, this section is not very much on the page, but it's wildly important for world building purposes. Only one altar is going to be chosen by the player, but all of the altar options are doing the job of telling the player something about the world, telling the, the player something about the faith, and um, and almost always come up again in role play. I've run this game a lot now, and the altar options that don't get chosen still turn up in the campaign and the story because the player is looking for things to inspire their role play, right? So the altars are are, are, are really are, are a really big deal in terms of sort of inspiring role play. Some things you might consider when you're thinking about your altar, is the faith a licensed faith or not? Is it the St. Electric again versus the Trawler Man, right? This might have an implication for what the structures or places of worship are like. A licensed faith might have more formal structures and places of worship, right? Whereas an unlicensed faith might be a bit more ad hoc. Think about the fact that the custodians are always on the move. Altars, therefore, can be things that are easy to carry and stow, or alternatively, they can be places that are relatively easy to visit during their travels. Think about future role-playing scenes. What kinds of scenes might be cool for the players to have, and how might the altar be an inspiration for those scenes? I love the example, uh, well, we have Amanda on the call. Um, Amanda's St. Electric custodian in my campaign of the Silverses, uh, Sedna, she uses a, a portable radio as her altar, right? And what I love about this is we get all these really great scenes of that character communing directly with the Saint Electric through that radio. So it'll just be a scene of her character just kind of chilling with the radio on and divine stuff is coming through the radio, right? Like it's a really, really, they're really great scenes. And that's all stuff that was inspired directly from the altar choices. The Waxen Scrivener, one of the options is a bookshop break room. You can imagine that altar leading to a whole set of secondary side characters, right? Like characters that only appear at the bookshop and that only interact with the follower of the Waxen Scrivener custodian, right? Like, so that's, an, you know, it's, it's, there's an implication there. There's, it's, it's, a, it's, it's an invitation to create more world, right? Uh, the Watcher in the Wings has an option that's a puppet show. Can you imagine, like, you, like a really, really dedicated player, like thinking about and describing their puppet show scene and the people who go to the puppet show and maybe they eventually start to develop character names for the puppets and all this other stuff, right? Like, like think about like how the altar might create role play, like scenes, right? Just like what kinds of things might be inspired by it. I think a really key thing, and this is an insight that I had when I was preparing these notes, the altars should say more about the custodian than the god. Gabriel might disagree with me there, and, and, and if you do, Gabriel, pipe up. But my feeling is that the altars say more about the custodians than they do the god. Because what they're doing is they're showing how the custodian worships the god, not necessarily how other followers of that faith worship that god, right? And so that's another, it's a, it's a, it's a subtle distinction, but it's something to, to think about. Like, these altars say something about the player character, right? So um, a little insight that I had that I wanted to share with you. And for this last little section, I want to talk about, um, or for this last part of this section, I want to talk about the verse of prophecy. As a general matter, the verse of prophecy represents a winding road progression of the custodian's personal faith, their introduction to the faith, their moment of weakness, and their eventual renewal in the faith, right? Their strengthening. Not every verse of prophecy needs to adhere to the following structure. Uh, indeed, not all the ones in the official game do. Uh, but I think more or less, this is what each of the steps in the verse of prophecy represents. The whispered psalm is almost always the custodian's first contact with the faith. When they were initiated into the rites, maybe something that happened to them as a child, uh, the first time they got their vestments or whatever, just, just a moment that like showed their beginning in the faith. The Ashen Circle usually represents an initiation into the deeper mysteries, reflection upon which leads to an increase in the communion score. The Bleeding Witness 
this is a really, really important one. Uh, it's the big moment when the custodian's faith was tested or when they showed weakness. It sometimes comes with a bonus power or move or a new way of sort of playing the game or understanding characters within the game. The sweltering circle is another big important one. I think it's probably the, the most important one in a lot of ways. This is the moment when the custodian's faith is renewed, which then leads to the flesh ascended, say your final prayer, more on that later. So those are all of my notes for this first section. I'm going to review the questions in the chat and see if there's anything we want to talk about from chat. Also, if you want to just ask your question um, live, you can also do that. Let's see here. Um, uh, Aaron has a question about alternate names. What rationales might there be for picking one name among several as the God's main name and the others as alternates? Mm, that's really good. I thought about this actually, because I was gonna have some notes on it. And I'm and, and the truth is I'm not really sure. I think it is, I don't think it matters too much if I'm being perfectly honest. I think that, I think you should, the one that you think sounds coolest should probably be the main name. And then uh, the, other, the, the others, can be the alternate names. But if anybody has any thoughts on that, I'm happy to hear it. Gabriel, if you have some thoughts on it, I'm happy to hear it. We yeah. didn't have to pick the names of the gods that we put in the game because that was done for us. <laughs> um, so so we're maybe not even the best people to ask. But. Well, so some of them, um, like with the Saint Electric, the first two alternate names are from the Silver versus Lore book and I added the others. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's mostly vibes. Um, yeah. yeah, what's cool <laughs> to you. But one way I like to think about it is that there might be the official branded license name, but in your village where you grew up, um, maybe there was an older version of this god that you called this other name. It could be something very personal to your character, which is how they know it, even though more popular names are different. So, um, and the variation kind of like the altars can be cool to give you a spread of like different potential flavors for the god too. So it's never just one thing. There are a couple of really good notes in here about regionality, and I want to just read a couple of them so that people watching the video get the benefit of it. Uh, Gabriel notes that the names could be something like a regional variation, uh, like he just said. Uh, maybe there's like a more wider known name, which is more of a marketing slash propaganda name. That's a great way of looking at it. Um, Amanda notes that there could be rural or urban divides, like maybe the god is known one way in cities and another way in rural places. I love that. Um, that's really good. Still kind of looking at the chat here a little bit. Oh, another option, secret names that only those deep in the faith come to realize. I like that too. You could even tie the creation of a secret name to a verse of prophecy, I think that could be kind of fun. Like describe the time when you learn the secret name of your God, that could be kind of, that could be really cool. Uh, so yeah, I think we pretty well covered that question. Any other questions? Uh, I see a hand up, I see chaotic and what else says, and David. David, I think you were first though. Uh, I can't hear you. Sorry, I'd hit the uh, physical mute on my mic. Um, yeah, no, I was just going to say, kind of following on from that, um, the discussion on um, like picking a primary name, um, I think beyond the kind of law type reasoning for picking it up and, and, and the vibe space reasons for picking it up, I also think it is also important to remember that this is something that people need to be able to use in game and it needs to kind of like picking a really long and esoteric name as the primary name for the playbook is probably not a good call because it's just going to be a pain to to actually use practically sort of thing um so i think i think you want something that's kind of quite punchy and communicates if not everything about the god at least a big part of what the god is about just just from the name itself um so i think in terms of yeah picking the one that is the playbook name um, that's what I'd look at kind of thing. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 um, the sort of secondary names are your kind of chance to play around a bit more, but I think that, that, that primary name does need to be something kind of quite punchy and something you can grab and something you can just like say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm worshiping the troller man as a, that's my playbook kind of, kind of thing. Yeah, it's a great point. Uh, Chaotic, do you have a question? Uh, ju just to build on to that, what David said, because I entirely agree with that, because like it's how you say it 
at the table that matters. Uh, for example, uh, like like uh, with a pox martyr, like the, like oh yeah, that 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 is like a monk and uh, whatnot. But like then you get to say out the names aloud with brother, sister, and this uh, uh, brother Boyle and sister pox and uh, that sort of thing. Like like it it should almost tell a story with each name being said in succession when you first introduce the playbook and the last one should be really either somewhat on the sinister side or the most extreme like sort of representation of the god yeah i like that there's th this idea of like using the alternate names to to suggest like another mode or vibe or historical uh, point of view about the god is really really wise and smart and again though i want to go back to my my point in the notes though which is that doesn't have to make perfect sense right everybody in, who worships this god has their own way of viewing the god their own like their own reasoning for things it just has to be inspirational it just has to lead the players and the keeper down a certain path so that when they get ready to play the game their their brain you know the the brain's firing off different ideas and stuff and, and different ways of exploring and exploring the God. Okay, so um, I think at this point, uh, we'll have more time for questions at the end, but I think at this point, I wanna go ahead and break off into groups. So the way this is gonna go, I am going to, we're gonna form groups. I'm gonna assign them based off who's here and, and uh, your kind of general order as I'm viewing you. Once we break, I do recommend the groups go create a little Discord a Discord chat thread in the writing contest channel just to um, have all your communications together. If you want to then jump onto a Discord voice call, I think that's perfectly fine uh, if that would be easier for you. In the interest of time, I recommend quickly assigning the various parts of the writing exercise within your group and then get to writing. Uh, don't spend a lot of time like discussing things, just figure out which part you're writing and then write. And then if you want to confer at the end of the period, then go ahead and confer. Um, but you know, you, you'll find your own little rhythm, but you don't have a lot of time to find that rhythm. So uh, I recommend just start writing. Um, and so with all that said, um, I'm going to assign uh, groups, but if you don't show up into the Discord chat, that's fine. That just means you're not interested in this part of the, the, the workshop and that's perfectly fine. Uh, everybody who's there will, will, will do the thing. Um, once the groups are assigned, what I'm looking for is three alternate names for the God that you get assigned, some basic details about the faith, how does the God appear or otherwise make itself known in the world, how do followers show their devotion, what are some practical real world effects of this God's worship, uh, give me five altars, and then uh, write the verse of prophecy, you don't have to write it out completely, just a general like a general idea of like what the player will be doing whenever they mark that verse of prophecy. We have, we're gonna do four groups. Uh, our group one is going to be, uh, let's do, let's see, how many do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13. Uh, uh, Demon said uh, they wanted to be skipped, so that's fine. So we'll go with 12, so that's four groups of three, basically. Yeah, okay, cool. So group one is going to be uh, chaotic, Ray and Lynn. Group two is going to be Arachno Communist, Steph and Nick. Uh, group three is going to be Aaron, David Morrison, and Brian. And group four is going to be Amanda, Gabriel, and Corey. Uh, so group one, your god is the Twilight Prowler, a god of cat burglars. Group two, you're going to be doing Chompers the Clown, the mascot god of a chain of fast food restaurants. Group three, you're doing Big Top, a god that is a circus. And group four, you are doing the Dark Underbelly, an insect god of terrible things that are hidden in otherwise pleasant places. So think David Lynch movies, right? And so with all that said, uh, if there, if you have any questions for me uh, at this point, ping me in Discord. Um, we're gonna break until. Um, let's just go until the end of the hour. So we will meet back up at one o'clock Eastern. We will uh, share some of the things that we've written. We don't have to share all of it, and 
you can share as much or as little as you wish as a group, but we'll share some of the things we've written and then we'll continue with the moves workshop. Uh, so I will see you all in about 25 minutes. Okay, we're back. So before we share, I want to just remind everyone that this is just something we're doing to stretch our creative legs a little bit and to uh, apply some of the things we talked about in the first section. So if you have any feedback for anyone, try to keep it uh, positive and constructive uh, rather than negative, please. And um, yeah, and feel free to share as much or as little as you want. Uh, if you manage to write everything, you know, tell us as much as you want to. If there's just a few things you're particularly proud of, you can tell us those things as well or, or just those things. But I just want to see how everyone did. So let's, and then after you kind of share your stuff, uh, if I have any thoughts, I'll share them. If anybody else has any thoughts, they should feel free to jump in and share them. So let's go with group one, the Twilight Prowler, a god of cat burglars. Um, what did you all come up with? Uh, we came up with uh, the Twilight Prowler, uh, the Thief of Shadow and Knights, the Whispering Lockpick, Princess Surefoot. Criminals are often thought to be a superstitious and cowardly lot, but the art of the cat burglar is not something one just stumbles into. It is an oral tradition of cautions and techniques, secret signs, and hushed voices. The cat, the twilight prowler, watches over those who would take from the shadows in silence. You've demonstrated some talent over your career thus far, but you will know that just one false move, one forgotten step, could send you plumbing into poverty, ruin, or worse, abandonment. Being well acquainted with the wards and sigils you use to thwart your craft is part of honing those skills. The best strategy is knowing when to show your hand and when to gamble it all. The night is long, and your fellow cat's paws should help if given enough incentive to do so, but do not, do not ever forget, even with all your skill in stealth and trickery, the eye of the twilight power will never leave you. Uh, should I continue or should we go to another group? Uh, no, I, let's just do all of the twilight prowler stuff and mm -hmm. then we'll, we'll keep going. Uh, altar items. Gemstones melted together. They no longer have any worth. A secret cache that is marked by a cat's eye. An alley full of overflowing trash and receptacles and stray cats forgotten by most, but home to the discarded, a safe hidden in a public place, unobserved by the cover of night. Uh, verses of Prophecy, uh, the whispered psalm, narrate a flashback to the time you thought you were alone and undetected, only to find the prowler looking over your shoulder with pride. The Ashen Circle, narrate a flashback to a crime that you committed that was ultimately blamed on someone else, increase your communion by one, the Bleeding Revelation, narrate a flashback to a time you faltered in your task, you recognize the mark as someone from your past saw something that caused you to hesitate or felt a spark of empathy. How did you bring yourself to complete the job, and what regrets do you carry from the, that moment? The Sweltering Crucible, narrate a scene in the present day that shows you putting all of your chips into the Twilight Prowler for one last job. Fantastic. Uh, I really liked that. I thought that was really, really solid. Uh, I, would, I mean, like, let's print it. It was really good. Um, I thought you did a really good job with the themes. Uh, I liked how you worked in, like, visual motifs, like the gems, but also, like, cat's eye, which is also a gem. Uh, I liked the sort of... Um, I liked the sort of, like, interesting benevolence of the god. Like, they didn't seem, like like a particularly gnarly god they were more like just a cool god <laughs> i'm a cool god um and uh yeah it, it was there was a lot of really fun stuff there anybody else have any thoughts on the twilight prowler so far all right no, then. I really liked it. I thought that was really evocative. And I think, like, for role play wise, it gives a whole lot to work with, mm -hmm. a lot of really fun aspects and techniques to really kind of latch onto, which is mm -hmm. always fun. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's great. I can also see, like, a, well, maybe this will come up when you start writing moves for it, but I, I could see, like, a situation where, like, uh, 
almost like um almost like the factotum in the between like where they have like a network of like street people who like help them out or whatever that could be a lot of fun uh okay fantastic um let's go ahead and go over to group two which was chompers the clown the mascot god of a chain of fast food restaurants who wants to speak for chompers i mean if you don't mind hearing a uh, pizza place music in the background then I can do that. You're Which coming through great. Actually, Go ahead. It's kind of it's kind of fitting now that I'm thinking about it. Uh, so, the Chompers the Clown. Uh, we've got some. We'll just start with the alternate names here. Uh, that which smiles and rends the grease of laughter, ringmaster of the holy lard, potentate friar friar, the salted teeth. Uh, the great fried jester who sustains and preserves through lard and oil has been in your family for as long as you can remember. The crisp and hot breading sustaining and protecting those who bear its armor. Sacrifice the flesh, the salted teeth, begets you the abilities. That's all I have written. But, but there was uh, there's more for the, as far as the altars and stuff goes. Uh, for altars, we have a rusty deep fryer ringed with teeth pools of coagulated fat and blood drifting at the bottom. The kitchen of a fast food joint, grinning employees and sharpened implements. A dinner tray, prayer marks scored deep into the plastic. A busted animatronic clown, dull laughter and a ready mouth for offerings. A frigid meat locker, unidentifiable carcasses on bloody hooks. Uh, as far as sort of general details of the faith go, uh, the idea is that the employees or followers will dip a limb into a deep fryer and sacrifice that to Chompers the Clown, who will then be built out of the limbs of the fried employees. Uh, and uh, employees give their flesh to the god, the god gives its flesh to the customers like a fucked up Eucharist. Uh, it's pretty great. Uh, and you know, the holy temple of Chompers the Clown is uh, the Chompers Play Place, of course. Uh, it's where all of the fun and laughter of everyone can be had. As far as verses go, we have uh, the Whispered Psalm is the initiation into the faith, uh, which body part you sacrificed and why. Uh, your Ashen Circle is the first communion with Chompers. Anything you eat tastes like deep fried curds. The original flavor sacrificed the Chomper, but your mind and faith strengthens. Uh, the Bleeding Revelation is when uh, a time that Chompers hunger took more than it gave back. Uh, and the Sweltering Crucible, renewed faith in the glory of fast food and flesh for glorious succulent flesh. Fantastic. Uh, I love Chompers. The con's disgusting and horrible in all the right ways. Um, I particularly liked the all the references to like real world things, like the play place um, and stuff like that. Uh, the idea of the fucked up Eucharist is pretty amazing. Uh, yeah, really, really good stuff. I think what's going to be really interesting for that group when you go to the next writing exercise is making moves for it. I'm dying to know what the moves are going to be for this, this god. Um, but I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. Uh, any other thoughts on Chompers the Clown? I, I think the satire potential for like what you described is just so, so strong. I know that's what Silk Versus is known for, especially when you described it as a fucked up Eucharist. It's like just Jeff's kiss, Jeff's kiss. It's disgusting. I went into my mouth. Huh? Lynn, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to share. Um, so the the chitterling kind of like takes up this role in the world right now. But I loved how like this really took that and just like went in a slightly different way and like created so much more context and like detail um, that isn't like isn't dealt with with the chitterling. And so like there's there, of course, in like the real world, there's like all kinds of, you know, fast food chains and there's there's room for more than one of them here too. I love it. Well, and I suspect that like, I have a feeling that the chompers would be like a, a facet of the chitterling, right? Like that's my guess is that it would be like a, a branch, a spinoff of the chitterling. Right. But um, yeah, it's super cool. 
Any other thoughts on chompers? Chompers is so greasy. I love it. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, good job, group two. Uh, group three, which is Big Top, uh, a god that is a circus. Who wants to speak for group three? I'm happy happy to, to share what we got. Um, <clears throat> for our, our alternate names, we have Old Rootless, The World's Delight, uh, the eternally welcoming family and round and round. Um, we didn't we didn't come up with a with a concrete paragraph. We we spent a lot of time on the vibes, um, but we're trying to sort of distinguish between. I mean, I I'd, I'd played something wonderful just outside of town, and we were trying to kind of go in a slightly different direction um, for the sake of the exercise. So we wanted to think about a circus as a found family and sort of leading into that found family uh, trope. Um, so thinking of devotees as those who had been outcasts or oddballs in their in their own context, finding in the faith a new found family, but needing to leave behind what stability they had had, what family they had had. We kicked around the idea of whether that sort of needing to sacrifice one's former life maybe was a little more literal. Um, but we we sort of let that we let that be. We didn't go too far into it. Um, show devotees showing their devotion by picking up and becoming nomads, becoming part of this family, and gradually, um, not just becoming part of a family, but almost becoming part of a macro organism. So we figured that the bodies of devotees who would who would pick up and travel with the god would gradually become part of the bot, become part of their god. The uh, the the body parts like adapting into a niche, almost like an organ or a, or an a species in an ecosystem. Um, altars, I gotta find them here. Um, we have a concession stand with a strong smell of buttery popcorn, an abandoned storage room filled with bloody props for dangerous stunts, a large trunk covered in rhinestones and sequins, a warped mirror surrounding by sparkling light bulbs, and a dressing room full of paints and costumes. I think all of those we could probably find a second clause for for those the way they typically seem to be in the in the faith sheets and with our verses uh i think i have this this written down no. um with our verses the whispered psalm narrative flashback of when the eternally welcoming family took you in while you were at your lowest um, the Ashen Circle narrated a flashback to when you first truly mastered your freakish gift. Uh, the Bleeding Revelation narrated a flashback to a time when visitors to the circus gave you a glimpse of something you had left behind. What were the consequences of your doubt in that moment that you could remain part of your new family? What gave you the strength to say, uh, to stay? Um, and then we experimented with a move. Um, hereafter, when you encounter a new side character, you may ask the keeper what manner of performance would be most likely to entice them to stop what they're doing and watch. Um, and finally, uh, the sweltering crucible, narrate a scene in which you discover that you're strong in your faith again, knowing that your family had your back against any who would seek to harm you. Fantastic. I think what works best in this one, as you've presented it, is this idea of the circus as a found family and then this idea of the found family taking on the this 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 notion of like a singular unit comprised of multiple parts component parts um what i, I think i think what makes it work really well is the fact that a lot of times what's happening in tsv the, both the audio drama and the game is the gods are clearly standing in for some real world concept or thing you know and so here we have circus as um as a a a lens through which to understand found family i could even see like if this was something that like you continued working on i could really see this going into places of like of like like you know, but maybe specifically explore exploring like ideas of like queer found family, or like um, or like maybe I mean you could go you could go to some really dark places with it too. Honestly, like like you know the idea of like the custodian ran away from something particularly dark and abusive, right? And so and that's how they found this found family, right? But um, I love it. I think it's I think I think it's really cool so far. Any other thoughts on Big Top? I really liked I that altar of the concession. Oh. Sorry. 
I just thought that was a really great altar. <laughs> Glad you it. liked it. Yeah, I had similar thoughts on the altars. Very good. I love a good altar. Mm -hmm. I think the altars I... do so much, like they do so much world building in such a short space, right? Which I think is great. Yeah, one one direction I think you could explore and maybe the moves or the final part or something would be a lot of sort of old circuses, you know, had the, the circus animals and such. You could do something interesting maybe with saints in that. Yeah, I think that's that's where all of these faith sheets shine is not only to see the custodian, but then the custodian's relationship to angels and saints and the ways that those develop. I, I was actually thinking more in terms of angels, like what kinds of like ambient wildlife or parasitic phenomena happen in the context of the circus, but also thinking in in terms of a macro organism like gut flora in in this you know extended sense i mean i i always want to lean into the body horror stuff so i really i was excited about it, it was um it wasn't my idea it was i think it was david's the idea of the bodies the bodies of devotees gradually like remolding themselves to adapt to the niche of their particular performance as if like performing a role within the wider thing but i think we could see that at the at the larger um the ecosystem level as well not just those those devotees I do agree, though, that with arachno communists, though, that like there is this, there's a lot of space there to do something with both angels, especially angels, right? Uh, because in this setting, angels are just animals that are like <laughs> around <laughs> the god, right? Just uh, animals, I and mean, it could be like rappers or like, like little. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I could see like angels. Rappers. Yeah, like, an, like animal angels. I could see like, uh, like sideshow performer saints, you know? Like, imagine a saint that is now like, permanently installed as sideshow or something like that you know i don't know there's it could go in a lot of cool, cool directions um but but i think your direction of like it being this like organism is a really cool way of of looking at it for sure um i, I yeah I, I do just want to write a move called summon elephant now <laughs> yeah, <very good. laughs> okay let's go ahead and go to group four uh group four is the dark underbelly an insect god of terrible things that are hidden in otherwise pleasant places who wants to speak for group four You want to take it, Amanda? Sure, I'll take it away. <laughs> so we have some uh, kind of bare bones, ready to get fleshed out stuff. Uh, the dark underbelly. The This is the insect god, hidden in otherwise pleasant places. Also known as the rotting heart, great at maggoty, and the swarm that eats itself. The dark underbelly was originally a deity of natural growth and decay processes, but urbanization has spurred the stray god into a spiteful god of the rotten chaos that lives beneath everything. You know the dark underbelly is just beneath the surface when you see streams of insects slithering and crawling from cracks in the pavement and people with wide, maggoty smiles. Worship of this god is performed in small ways, dropping an apple into a bunch, uh, or sorry, dropping a rotten apple into a bunch, or through more spectacular acts of sabotage, such as encouraging the growth of mildew and molds to take down a building. People deliberately ignore the chaos and rot, but you will tear away the thin veneer of order and beauty and show them the truth underneath. For our altars, we have a moldy meat freezer full of leaking packages, a wasp nest grown around an abandoned mannequin, a pet filled with writhing parasites, a fruit tree rotting from the inside that bears moldy fruit, and a book of legal gods, the insides filled with choking spores. Our verses of prophecy, the whispered psalm, narrate when you first realize there is chaos and rot hidden beneath everything. The ashen circle, narrate when the horrific face behind a pleasant facade spoke the truth to you. The bleeding revelation, narrate when you realize that something precious to you is rotting away and how a piece of yourself with it. The sweltering crucible, Narrate a scene in the present day showing your determination to prove to the world something reveal, revered is actually rotten at its core. And of course, the final prayer, which is, where lies the strangling fruit? We'll talk about the final prayer a little bit later, but uh, really digging it so far. Yeah, very, very good. I, I think when I had this like idea five minutes before we started i was thinking of like um i was really i was thinking a lot of like like kind of like neighborhoods 
where there's like a lot of gossip and you know everyone like puts on this a happy face but like underneath there's all kind like behind closed doors there's all kinds of like shit going on you know um and i think you definitely captured some of those like ideas like in a physical form like this idea of rot this idea of of nice things having like something at their core that is that is messing it up right that is that is underneath uh yeah really really cool i um uh, i'm actually of your group i'm most familiar with your members writing uh, and so like so like i could definitely see a lot of already like a lot of your particular styles coming up uh particularly gabriel and amanda your, your, your writing styles are really shining there um fantastic any thoughts on the dark underbelly I actually went into a, di a way I didn't expect because I was thinking more of like, like the sort of when you turn over a rock and like there's like an ecosystem of like insects l thriving underneath there. Uh, I was more thinking along the lines of like a, an oppressive force and like sort of an underdog type of god. And this is like, this is very a unique take where like people can have like different ideas about like the same sort of subject matter because like the rods just make sense. So like, of course, like I, how could I not see this before? So like, I'm very fascinated with like this interpretation. Any other thoughts, even for members of the group four, anything else you want to share? I mean, I think an early um, thought was kind of like Chaos said, um, like part of it seems to be about the revelation of just like pulling off the mask or lifting the rock or whatever. So like witnessing that is kind of their deal. Um, but I also think it'd be fun to explore some less literal um, physical things like you were saying, sort of like mm -hmm. the corruption in an organization or the, the lies that are unspoken and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, that was really great. I hope you all uh, got something out of that. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to all of your your uh, your efforts. They were really interesting, and I even after the call, I hope you all can continue um, exploring these gods and doing something with them. Let's move on to the next section of the workshop, which is going to be uh, the moves workshop plus a little note about final prayers. So moves. The first part of the workshop is creative writing stuff. This is really mechanical stuff, right? So the thing about moves, um, some general thoughts about moves and specifically how they relate to the Silt versus role-playing game. Don't worry about mechanical balance between faith sheets, but do worry about mechanical balance within your faith sheet. So this is what I mean. It doesn't really matter if you write if your faith sheet is really really overpowered or underpowered as compared to one of the official faith sheets or a, another faith sheet that someone else has written because uh in no cfb game is that ever a consideration in the between the factotum is far and away the most powerful playbook right uh the undeniable is also very very powerful but it doesn't matter because the it's 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 not about balance between the characters like that the way that the characters should be balanced is in, to an extent that we are trying to find some kind of balance between them is are they cool <laughs> right so you your your job is just to make sure you're writing something really cool vis-a-vis -vis other stuff that's out there because that's what players are going to like pick up on they don't know enough about the game at the start to know like what's better and not better in terms of the mechanics all they know is, wow, that's a cool bug god, or wow, I want to shoot electricity out of my fingers, or wow, there's a god that like, you know, that that eats grave dirt. Like, you know, it's just stuff like that, right? So within faith sheets, balance, not such a big deal in terms of mechanics. Uh, just write something cool. Will people play this or they want to play it because it sounds cool? However, within your faith sheet, there should be mechanical balance. Moves can be powerful, but if so, they should come with some trade-offs. So maybe the move, you know, has a really cool effect, but it adds a condition to the player character afterwards. Maybe it can only be used in certain circumstances, like once a session, or if you do a really, really specific fictional trigger, like maybe there's there's some limitations in that way. Maybe at the really far end of things maybe the move forces the writing of a verse that would be a really tough move but it would but but presumably the effect would be really really powerful um maybe there are follow-on actions if you look at like the cairn maiden right uh the cairn maiden that the core move in that one is all about like 
built is like is like the keeper setting up future scenes right like okay cool you got to do this by the way there's a dying person over here you need to go minister to right you got to get that done at some point right so there's follow-on actions that might limit the power of a move and so forth so always be thinking about that like if you if you're looking at all your moves and one or two of them seem a little stronger than the others mechanically you should absolutely think about how you can put some limitations on them to make it all balance out a little bit more um also when you're looking at your additional moves which is to say the moves beyond the starting move think about i think the main consideration big picture for the additional moves is would a player have a hard time choosing which additional move to take whenever they advance if the answer is yes you're probably in good shape because you want each of your five additional moves to be individually enticing right there shouldn't be one that's like clearly the weak link right that nobody's going to pick right so that's another thing to keep in mind uh faith sheets generally have one starting move and five additional moves you can vary this for your own publications and homebrew i do not recommend varying from this for the contest for the contest you should absolutely stick to one starting move and five additional moves i just think that's the wiser move let's talk about the starting move so this is far and away the most important move it is the anchor of the whole faith sheet it represents the core powers and talents of the custodian, right? So for the St. Electric, it's the custodian's ability to manipulate electricity and have electricity flow through their body. For the pox martyr, it's the ability of the custodian to physically take in the ailments of, 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 of afflicted people. That is, that those are the core functions and themes of those faith sheets. And the, starting move anchors that it is the expression of that it's the move that the custodian will be engaging with the most and when it comes to faith sheet selection it is the number one thing players will read and pay attention to they may not read all the additional moves they may not read all the fine print on the introduction they are definitely going to read the the toy that they get to start and that's going to help them make their decision right they're going to read that starting move and be like oh that sounds really cool i want to do that so it's an important move. I think when you're writing your starting move, you should you should go big, go crazy, go big with it. My feeling is, you know, there are going to be people who are really interested in game design or in putting their own unique stamp on the game mechanically. The starting move is the place to do it. This is the place to really go big and to and to go to go really wild and be creative with how you with how you do this, what you write, right? Um, I will tell you that if past contests are anything to go by, the judges will reward your creativity on the starting move more than they will penalize you for it being uneven in playability, right? So creativity is more important on this than playability, I think, and that's been my experience with how these contests have gone in the past. Um, Obviously, they should work. Uh, if you can make the move work, the work should be reasonable, or the move should be reasonably sound and playable. Uh, that will give you an edge versus other people, I think. But I think it's better to come up with something really, really cool that the judges are going to be like, "Oh, that's so cool!" Like even if it's a little, even if it's a little hokey and it doesn't quite work, you know, that's something that gets smoothed out later. But the judges are going to be really here for like the cool thing that your character does. Um, so. Some things you might think about for this starting move, and these are all just examples that come from the, the, the core faith sheets in the game. Starting moves can have uh, tracks or new currencies. So there's like the charge track on the St. Electric. Uh, there is the, uh, the inkwell thing on the Wax and Scrivener. There's the fate boxes on uh, the Karen Maiden. Sometimes, the starting moves break the rules in a very big way. So 
see the pox martyr. The pox martyr starting move breaks the rules massively. They get six conditions instead of three. They can't clear conditions in the normal way. Uh, whenever they take condition, they're affected by conditions differently, right? Like there's a, the, the rules of the game are really, really different because of that starting move for that character. So breaking the rules is one way you can make your move stand out. I think complexity is okay. The players have time to live with and learn the starting move. So it's okay if it's fairly complex and wordy. Like if you're going to have a big wordy move, that's where it should live, right? And the wordiness should serve the design goal, right? Like, so, you know. Um, consider what kinds of scenes might come, come from the move, right? Um, are there follow-on actions and follow-on scenes? Again, the Karen Maiden uh, is a great example because that move sets up future scenes. The Pox Martyr, it, there's this idea of the move implies that the Pox Martyr or the Pox Monk character is going to be uh, taking the abscesses and broken limbs of other people into their body and we're going to have cool scenes like that right um there's a lot of implication there there's a lot of implication for like what this is going to look like the saint electric starting move there's a it's a there's a lead up to one particular big scene on that move that when the boxes all get marked everything's going to go haywire shit's going to start exploding and people are going to get fried right like that is that's the thing so be thinking about like what kinds of scenes are like implied or explicit in the move so be big be creative give it and all of your other moves a really cool name uh there are a there's no particular naming convention you need to go with, but some ideas are the names together uh, can be a poem or a prayer. That's incredibly creative and smart. Um, this is not in TSV, but in the between one of the playbooks, the legacy, the legacy's moves when read top to bottom, the titles, they are the, uh, they're the oath that the character takes, uh, uh, for their for, for their little hunter monster hunter family right like if you just read them straight up they're like they're like the oath that they take um, so that's one thing you can do you can have the names be references to real world media or sayings that's what a lot of our faith sheets uh, in the core game do um, alliteration is your friend uh, moves just sound better when they're when they're alliterative so if you if you can't think of anything have some alliteration going on in your move titles. Starting move, very important. Um, additional moves. So by necessity, the additional moves should be somewhat scaled back as compared to the starting move, right? They shouldn't be quite as detailed. They shouldn't be quite as complex. They should be much more straightforward. Um, they definitely should support or otherwise connect directly to the mechanics and role play of the starting move. So in most of the ones that we've published, the additional moves either use the same track or currency that's in the starting move, such as Fate or uh, the charge marks on St. Electric. Sometimes uh, the supporting moves alter or, or enhance the scenes or outcomes of the starting move in some way. So they don't have to connect directly back to the starting move, but it's a good strategy for the additional moves. Uh, it's perfectly okay to just reskin the moves from the official faith sheets. Nothing wrong with that. You will not be judged harshly for that. If you want to just take your faith sheet and just reskin all the moves on one of our faith sheets, that's totally cool. You can absolutely do that. Uh, game design is iterative, and uh, game design is is we're all helping each other ultimately. Um, so that's another thing to be mindful of. So before I dive into move types and this particular move structure I want to get into, I think I want to check in with questions or comments here. So does anybody have any thoughts? Uh, Gabriel, go ahead. Um, just a comment on, on the importance of theme um, and going big with that first move. So like the way I try to approach it is really, really thinking about, um, you know, what this God is about, what being connected to it is about and how that expresses itself in the world. And then from there, sort of like how differently are custodians going to interact with the world based on what God they're connected to. So like the trawler man has some moves there that are all about being this ruthless, uh, illegal 
god that sacrifices people to the river you know and the cairn maiden is much more like looming in the background and um, following this faded past they all have such a different vibe and i think uh just keep coming back to theme and then how that can be expressed like number one yeah great point very good point any other questions or thoughts I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, I'm going to check the chat really quickly. <laughs> Amanda being amazed about the legacy. That's yeah, really good. Go read it, Amanda. It's the it's yeah it's it's their little like family oath that they take. I can't believe I've yeah. never noticed. <laughs> I can't believe that. Um, fantastic. Let's keep going then. So, move types. Uh, okay, there's not like a definitive list of powered by the apocalypse or carved from Brindlewood move types. Uh, it's there's I'm sure there's lots of stuff out on the internet of like you know different you know claiming to have different you know like a collective exhaustive list of move types. I whatever. I don't think you need to be too concerned about like oh what are my options. It's not really that kind of thing. That said, I do think there are a few that we use a lot in the official game, and that might be a good thing to to try to emulate or focus on when you're writing your own moves. Uh, the first type is what I call the act under pressure type. Uh, more on that in a moment. I want to talk about that in more detail in a bit. The second type is a collection type. Um, and in a lot of ways, this is actually a, a this is a move type that that I kind of invented in the between um, and somewhat Brindlewood Bay, but really the between. I've never really seen this in other games too much before in terms of PBTA type moves. But basically collection type is you take the move and the move gives you an assortment of items to put into your altar. <laughs> That's basically it, right? Uh, like it's just it's just an equipment thing. You, you take this move and you get some equipment. Um, I think there's like two approaches. You can do three items plus a minor benefit. Uh, for an example of that, see the inspired circuitry move on the St. Electric, or you can do just five items. Uh, I don't think there's any like that in TSV, but in the between and public access, there's a couple of moves like that where you pick the move and you get five things to add to your uh, to your to your your section of the uh, equipment sheet or whatever it's called, the, the altar. So that's an approach. Um, the once per session type move, these are usually quite powerful, but can only be used once per session. Uh, they can be a very classic act under pressure type structure, but equally good are simple automatic outcomes. Uh, if we take a look at She Waits in Ruin from the Cairn Maiden, uh, that's a great example of a move that is once per session and it, there's no dice or anything. It's just a thing that happens and you, you get it and you get to do it once per session. The best moves sometimes have no hard mechanics on them, right? They're just, they're just fictional positioning. They're just cool things that happen. So. Um, I want to talk a little bit, oh, there's also another type uh, that I've identified that's pretty common in our games, which is the ability score increase type. In this type of move, an ability score goes up by one, and then there's a kind of minor benefit that goes along with it. Uh, brand recognition, which I think is a St. Electric move, uh, that's an example of the um, ability score increase type. There's all kinds of other move types. Like I said, you can just look through all the published uh, faith sheets that we've done or even just or even look at other CFB games and there's so many different like possibilities and things and you can kind of like I said you can take and reskin or re rejigger any that 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 fit your idea. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the act under pressure type. So uh, first of all Alex and I did an episode of Dark and Threshold about this and I recommend you go listen to it. I don't remember the name of the episode. I think it's moves or something maybe but in any case, we, we go into this type of move a lot. This is a really, really classic powered by the apocalypse style move structure, and it will serve you really well. And it's, in my opinion, very easy to do also. So the way it works is essentially it's, it's a variation on what we call the veiled move in this game, except that there is no negotiation between keeper and player and the keeper is hemmed in on complications and reactions i want to go deeper here so the veiled move says name what you're afraid will happen if you fail right um and then you say what it's going to be then you roll some dice if it's a 10 plus uh you succeed if it's a seven to nine you succeed but there's a complication and on a miss uh, you, you you probably fail and the keeper does a reaction. Now, it's a really, really trusty go-to move. It's a variation of 
classic act under pressure, act under fire, uh, risk type powered by the apocalypse moves that all kind of work the same way. The major difference with the veiled move and indeed in all the moves in my games that, that are like this is that there's a player keeper negotiation component where the player says aloud what they're scared is gonna happen. And sometimes, for example, in the revelation move or the night move, the keeper then says how it's worse that part of the move is is kind of a cfb thing it's not really in other pbta type games and so um and i think for the purposes of the structure you can disregard that negotiation part because what's going on with these types of moves more broadly is they are they do a lot of work in terms of possibilities right they cover a lot of possibility the veiled move can be used for quite literally any kind of risky or dangerous or scary reaction or, or or action right so anytime the characters do something risky anytime they're scared anytime there's danger this move might come into play and it can cover lots of different situations but because it can cover lots of different situations the keeper is has a lot of leeway in terms of like what might happen now on some level they're they're pinned in by the negotiation of what are you afraid is going to happen and the answer to that but when it comes to like complications or costs or when it comes to like a hard reaction like interpreting what the failure means the keeper has a lot of leeway and so when you write a move that uses a similar structure one of the powers of the move and one of the reasons why you want a move like this versus using just the veiled move is you are putting limitations on what the keeper can do right this is the power of it so here's what i mean if we take this basic structure we can kind of like turn it into a uh, like a fill in the blanks kind of thing and i have it here in the notes if you want to follow along the idea is when you take the specific action that triggers the move roll with whatever the ability is on a 10 plus you do what you intended on a seven to nine you do what you intended but there is a specific complication or cost on a miss there is a specific keeper reaction that specific part is what makes the move unique and it's what makes the move powerful because it limits what the keeper can do okay so let's have an example i'm not going to do a tsv example i'm going to do a, a between example because that's what i have more handy in my brain right now but imagine in the between we are going to summon a demon right okay i'm going to summon the demon that's the thing we're going to do now that could just be the day or night move right but if it goes poorly, all kinds of shit could happen. The demon could come and possess one of the player characters. The demon could tear down Hargrave House. The demon could set downtown London on fire. Like, who knows, right? Instead, if we write this specific demon summoning move, we might get, when you attempt to summon a demon, roll with sensitivity. On a 10+, plus, you summon the demon, and it will do as you ask. On a 7 to 9, it will be summoned, but it will only do what you want if you do something for it in return. So already we're limiting what can happen here. The worst that can happen on a seven to nine is the demon asks you to do something in return, right? On a miss, it could be you fail to summon the demon and indeed, the, or on a miss, you summon the demon, but it's not under your control. Now that's a little bit wide open, but at least it gives us some kind of sense of what could happen. It could be something like, on a, on a miss, you um, on a miss, you fail to summon the demon and you lose the ability to summon it again, or something like that, right? It's, it's just putting limitations on what the keeper can do in reaction, right? So that's kind of the idea there. I don't know if that makes sense, but think about it for a little bit. Eventually, it hopefully will. <laughs> um, but the structure is great because it's essentially just the basic kind of defy danger, act under pressure, PBTA type move, veiled move, day move, night move. It's basically just that, but with specific, fictionally specific kind of outcomes. And so I recommend this as a fine structure to work within when you're writing moves. It's a good baseline for creating moves. Like if you're just not sure where to start, you can kind of start here. And you might decide that your move doesn't need all the dice. You might decide, you know what? I think it'd be better if just, they can do this once a day and this happens and that's it, you know? Uh, but that's, but, but at least starting here, if you're not sure where to start, gives you kind of like something to work with and you can kind of 
play around with it and see if it makes sense and see if it works and kind of go from there. So a uh, question from Aaron, is it preferable to provide outcomes for all four role types or okay to have a 10 plus, including the 12 plus, et cetera? You know, uh, it's up to you, right? I mean, I think the key is like, what is the design goal with the move, right? Like if you intend for the move to, to like, I think it's important you have a trigger. You got to have a trigger, right, for this move type. Like, there has to be something that makes the move fire off. You should define the ability. And I think you should probably define the 10 plus and the 7 to 9. Maybe you leave the miss wide open, you know, still let the keeper react, right? But um, but it's, it's really up to you, just kind of whatever you think is, is best. And there again, you would compare it with your other moves that you've written for the faith sheet and see how it balances out. Like, maybe, maybe making that 6 more wide open will help make the move a little less powerful, and therefore it'll compare more favorably to the other moves, right? Um, uh, Gabriel has the note, you can often leave the miscondition out. Uh, that's true. Unless, again, unless you have a really specific idea, right? Like, I didn't really have a specific idea in my demon summoning thing, so maybe I should have just left it off, right? Um, but maybe if the move is really, really fictionally specific, you as the, as the game designer might have a really keen idea for what how this could go poorly. Write that into the miss, right? So, yeah. So, like, it's so like for the Watcher in the Wings, that'd be an example where I think the core move is your your setting up, you're describing this fiction to alter reality. And based on that face sheet, there's a specific thing that happens if you miss. Yes. Um, so it just, it demanded a bit more to be filled in there, but otherwise you wouldn't need to necessarily. That's right. D David uh, has a really good note here that a defined miss is a surprisingly powerful aspect of the move. Yes, it is. If you define the miss, you are making the move essentially much more powerful, right? Because you are really, really limiting what the keeper can do. If you don't define the miss, the move is just that much weaker because the keeper is a little more, has a little bit more room to 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 be nasty to the player, right? So uh, so that's, yeah, that's a really good observation. It's a good way of putting it as well. Uh, Chaotic, go ahead. Yeah, I would say like the bare minimum you would need to have the move is like, why, why are we rolling the move in the first place? The, the sort of hit condition. Mm -hmm. And then the seven to nine of like, of just like, hey, here's a complication that can happen with this move. So the keeper has like an option of like, oh, since this is sort of a midway result, I can figure out the miscondition from that as well as sure. like, yep. uh, and typically with seven to nine results uh, on a 10 plus, uh, the seven to nine doesn't happen. So like, that's the sort of implication of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, okay, so let me go on to final prayers. Uh, we're kind of switching gears a little bit, or switching gears here a little bit. Final prayers, this of course is the back sheet, the back side of the face sheet, uh, where once the final mark is made on the verse of prophecy, the character is going to unleash the final prayer to their god, and the character then retires from play. Um, here you want to think very big. Uh, Think about what would it look like if your god's power ran wild across the land? Who would be affected? How would the setting change? What shit is getting fucked up because the god is going wild over, over the land? Just an unleash, like, big anime moment, right? Like, think about that kind of moment. How does the custodian meet their end? This is also a very important consideration. Is the final prayer worthy of the character's story? This is the end of the character's story. So the final prayer should be, it should be equal to where this character has been. A character that's probably been played over the course of 12 to 15 sessions. Is this a suitably badass ending or cool ending, right? In the case of the Karen Maiden, I don't think it's a badass ending. It's just a very like, it's a it's a it's a it's a creepy cool ending right um so think about that as well think about like the fact that this is the end of the player's time with us consider writing the actual text of the prayer a few of ours have the actual prayer text on the final prayer uh, which is a fun thing because the player gets to read it in their cool custodian god voice or whatever um but otherwise, this is just a creative writing exercise. Uh, there, there's no mechanical implications here, uh, apart from the fact that it's the end of that character story. And uh, so it's just it's just a chance to sort of show the god in a maximalist fashion and how that affects the setting. An explosion of the god, if you will. So 
We are going to break off into our groups again, the same groups we had before. If you uh, were not here for the previous uh, exercise, I think everybody was, but if you weren't, uh, hit me up on Discord and I'll assign you to a group. But basically, we're going to go back into our groups uh, with the god you were working on before. We are now going to write a starting move, two additional moves, and a final prayer. You don't have to write the final prayer completely out. Just tell us what the final prayer does when, when the god explodes. <laughs> so, um, uh, so with all that said, uh, why don't we go ahead and uh, this won't be quite as long. We'll meet back up at 10 after, and then we'll see what everybody got. Okay. Okay, we're back from the second writing exercise. Let's go ahead and talk about the moves you've come up, come up with for your gods. Let's start with group one and the Twilight Prowler. We're looking for starting move, two additional moves, and what does the final prayer do? Who mm -hmm. wants to go speak for them? Uh, I will do so again. Uh, uh, you start with the final job. Uh, uh, use these boxes below to track for your final job. Whenever you mark your final job, ask another player to describe what you find that tells you you're one step closer to be pulling it off. These clues may be small or subtle, a piece of equipment, an idea, some blueprints, or some contact. Uh, you have 20 boxes, because I think this is going to be a campaign long thing. Whenever you resolve assignment with stealth or subterfuge or intend to do so, mark one of the final job boxes. After all the boxes have been marked, the next time you go off to mark the final job, in instead immediately mark the flesh ascended as you go off to complete your final job. Additionally, you may mark a, a box to add an item to your altar. Narrate a flashback telling everyone about how you prepared for this operation and how this item is was key to your success. Uh, adi your additional moves are, I'm just going to let myself in. When you break or into or trespass into an area owned by another person without their permission, roll with focus. On a 10 plus, narrate how you enter the space successfully and what opportunity you find once you enter. On a 12 plus, you also find a clue in that space. On 7 to 9, you enter the space, but the keeper narrates what evidence you leave that gives away that an intruder has been in the space tools of the trade. You have uh, assembled a trusted personal collection of professional equipment. Add the following items to your altar, rope and grapple, a bag of lockpicks and skeleton keys, crampons and uh, uh, pittance. Describe one additional piece of equipment, a personal invention that gives you an edge over your peers. Keep it secret despite the temptation to boast of, it, of its effectiveness. Uh, and the final prayer is the Master Thief. Shadows, once fixed and life locked, now roam here freely, taking valuables and cherished things across the peninsula into the night, never to see daylight. You are similarly lost into the night's gloom, but not before obtaining your heart's greatest desire. Describe how you emerge from the shadow and silence to seize it and carry it into the darkness, never to return. Uh, and uh, my fellow compatriots are continuing to write uh, for the playbooks. So. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Uh, I loved it. I thought it was, I thought those were great moves. Um, the, uh, I particularly, uh, the starting move is great. I was thinking about that number, the 20 boxes number. And I know that probably comes from like, um, from like the undeniable and stuff like that. Uh, I, I th I, I wonder, I think 20 is probably good because these characters do are meant to last more than one campaign arc as opposed to in the between. I'm actually thinking about for the final version of the between of lowering the reflection to like 12 or so boxes. I think that might be the better move. Uh, but those characters are only meant to go one campaign arc, except maybe not the undeniable. I don't know. But in any case, all that's just to say, I think you're probably in the right number there. Um, I love the way that the moves interact with other parts of the character sheet, like the Flesh Ascended and stuff like that. Um, and I also like that you really captured those sort of like one last job to catch a thief, like, you know, kind of uh, noirish, you know, like caper heist kind of things. I thought that was all really, really good. Uh, so yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a super, super cool moves to start. Any other thoughts on the Twilight Prowler's moveset so far, or the final prayer? 
I um at first I wasn't sure about the the move where you're like breaking into a place that that move I was like well how is this different from if you were just rolling it but then the more you got into it and the more specific in the details I'm like yes this feels like a cat burglar mystery so much it, it just felt really really wonderfully on theme so great job everybody that was fun I would definitely play that playbook mm -hmm. uh, Aaron do you have something to say yeah I um just in terms of the reference, I don't know if it was a direct reference to Blades in the Dark, but certainly that's what it brought to mind hearing the, you know, the, the sort of having already prepared, um, having already prepared and adding that item to the altar, marking the tracks so or using up the currency or getting that much closer, but gaining the altar item. Um, I love the the reference to the other game, if that's what it is. I'm trying yes. to block <laughs> the cathedral references into my face sheets. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm totally on that wavelength. Um, but I just thought that was that was clever and mechanically satisfying. <laughs> yeah, I I picked out twenty because like I just stole this move from the legacy because I'm just like, oh yeah, that they have a campaign arc where they're building up to something. Let's steal that. Uh, yeah, let's take yeah. from Blades in the Dark because they they get items. Let's go. Fantastic. Well, that was really great. Thank you all so much. Uh, let's go over to Group Two, which is is that the hamburger chain mascot chompers let's see here group two chompers the clown who wants to speak for group two so for our starting move we have bread and blood you offer chompers a body part finger a toe a limb in return for advantage on the next move you have i'm picking five or six flesh boxes and you mark one and in order to clear those boxes you have to graft on a piece of fried animal flesh. If you miss while doing that, you take too much and gain the condition clogged arteries. This does stack. The second move, the body is a temple. Your body is breaded and deep fried, giving you effectively bulletproof skin. You increase your vitality by one and take all vitality rules to resist physical harm at advantage, but it's crunchy and bad, so you have the permanent condition crispy. Our third move is Sacred Oil. You breathe out a spray of burning fire oil to melt away something of your choice. On a hit, choose one. On a 10+, plus, choose two. You find a clue in the ashes. You don't attract unwanted attention. No evidence is left behind. On a miss, Chompers devours you as well, turning you into a charred pillar of fried flesh. And for our final, final prayer, there we go, we have Dinner Bell. It's dinner time. Toll the bell and bread the fat. Let thy oil and lard flow through my varicose veins. Plug my arteries and bloat my form, O salted teeth, and chew my flesh to spit it upon the soil, where a new temple of laughter and hunger will grow from my breaded womb to satisfy all ages for time immemorial. Narrate a scene in which a blazing inferno of oil and flame descends upon the earth. Your flesh and the flesh of those around you is roasted to a perfect crisp and offered up to Chompers, who devours it happily and utilizes your flesh and oil to raise and consecrate a new Chompers Grease Fest chain. For limited time only, Chompers Chow Meals come with a complimentary effigy of your burnt and screaming visage. Sue the kiddos. Bravo. I hate it. Thanks. So good. Um, <laughs> yeah, really great. Uh, uh, 10 out of 10, no notes. Uh, no, it was really, it was really, it was really good. So disgusting. Uh, the body horror elements are balanced really nicely with the satirical elements. I think that's what makes it work. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I would have loads of fun with that character in a game. I think it would be really, really good fun. I even think that like the, ver the way you, I think the way that you present this in the final laid out form is you actually have like, either like on the starting move, you have like, almost like a mother style baby diagram with like the body parts that, that you mark them off as you as you sacrifice them um or maybe um i could even see like if if someone got really clever i could even see like the whole character sheet being styled like one of those little like crayon mat things that they give to kids you know um like like to, to keep them occupied during dinner so yeah that's really love it super cool uh, any other questions or comments on Chompers? I just love the sort of uh, uh, insidiousness of like, oh yeah, it does stack. And I'm just like, oh, oh no. I, I that was so good. Yeah. 
I absolutely love how snarky the final prayer is, especially the for a limited time only. I'm like, is this the good shit? <laughs> good, good job, good job. Fantastic. Okay, so with all that said, uh, let's go to group three and Big Top. All right. Um, we will start with the core ability that we came up with. Uh, the move is called Step Right Up. Huh. Your time spent as, as a member of Big Top's family has changed your body or mind in some irre irrevocable way, huh. better adapting you to the talent you cultivated. Gain plus one to an ability of your choice. Whenever you roll using your choosing abil chosen ability, mark the track below. Huh? We didn't actually come up with a number. This was just a lot of back and forth. Like, yeah, this is, this is, the, this is the deal, but I digress. So when you use your residual circus talent to entertain a side character, roll with your chosen ability, but do not mark your track. Huh? On a 7+, plus, unmark a box on your track, and the character is willing to aid you in a task or reveal a clue. Keeper's choice. On a 10+, plus, the character also leaves what they were doing and joins your group as an assistant or an accomplice. You may hereafter mark the character as if they were an item from your altar to gain advantage on a role in which they are assisting you with. On a miss, the character becomes hostile to you and your group and will attempt to drive you away. Um, let me just scroll up for the abilities that we came up with. Sorry, my apologies. Um, summon elephant. Mark an item from your altar to summon forth a terrible beast angel that will mostly follow your commands. Describe how it defeats a foe or overcomes an obstacle for you, and the keeper will describe the unexpected side effect of their manifestation. Um, next one that I see, Tears of a Clown. Once per session, you may mark a... Con Whenever another custodian rolls a miss, you may mark a condition to increase their result by one tier, but the keeper describes how you are left in a perilous position. And I know you asked for two abilities, but then there's this third one that we came up with, um, Jester's Privilege. I'm too proud of that name. I, I, I am too proud of that. Um, Jester's Privilege. Once per situation, you can successfully de-escalate de a tense situation with a bad joke and a smile. If the situation escalates to violence, any action you make to talk your way out of this mess is done so with advantage. And finally, the final prayer. The world is a circus and I'm the clown. Narrate a scene where you pray for your eternally welcoming family after having been away from them for so long. Within the next three minutes, they show up in full force, destroying buildings with sledgehammers, setting up tents, setting up concession stands, and turning this forsaken land into the circus. When all is said and done, all that is left of you is a statue commemorating your memory. Ask each custodian to detail one aspect of your statue. Well, That's good. Yeah, I I really dig it. Um, I I I like the uh, I like that there's a lot of implied scenes in these moves, right? Like you can see the role playing opportunities in a lot of these moves, and or like in these moves, and kind of where that's gonna come from, you know, like the telling of a joke. Like I could imagine if you have that move, like in between sessions the player is going to like look up bad dad jokes or whatever, you know, and have those like at the ready. So that's, that's really, really great. Um, the, uh, the final prayer is incredible. I love the little statue bit at the end. And um, one thing I would, one thing that occurred to me when you were reading the, the elephant move is because we know that this circus is like an organism, I think it would be pretty cool if that move was like pick listed and and it created like chimeric angels, right? To represent like this sort of like idea of like different entities coming together to form one entity. So it'd be the same basic move, but you would like pick list like elephant head, lion body, or like something like that. You know, you kind of create this like horrible angel monstrosity. But but uh, but that's just a 
that's just an idea I had. Uh, I thought it was great. Really, really love it. Um, yeah, super, super cool. Oh, Gabriel notes that Big Top is a thing in an upcoming assignment. Okay, don't write Big Top, <laughs> or at least, at least don't use that name. I'm sure that's where I got the name Big Top from when I was thinking of it's, it. Uh, it's Michael Van Vliet's circus assignment, which oh. um, is everything you'd expect. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Okay. Well, if well, group three, if you decide to write this, don't call it Big Top. Uh, call it something else. Um, but I do think you have distinguished it pretty sufficiently for what Michael's thing was. Um, if you want to keep pursuing it. Uh, no, really great. Any other thoughts? <laughs> Not the big top. Any other thoughts on uh, on this god? I guess one question we had that when it came up, we, we were kicking around the idea of having the track, you know, do the thing where the track fills up and you immediately say your final prayer. But unclear to me how to balance mechanically, even thinking like, as you were saying, within the sheet, how powerful is this ability to recruit side characters? We were thinking about like, okay, what, what element of the game can we break? And okay, are we just going to acquire a roving band of side characters? Can we have another a support move later on that allows us to sacrifice them or hollow them or do whatever? But then should we be limited in how often we do that or be forced to recruit them to unmark our track because otherwise the character goes up in smoke? So just negotiating those. Yeah. Just well, and, and from a game design standpoint, it's certainly like a major consideration, right? I think like for purposes of the contest, you don't worry about it too much. Like I wouldn't worry about that detail too much if I was writing this for the contest, because like I said, I think the judges are going to be judging much more on like the creativity of the move rather than like the, the details of whether they think it works or not. Uh, if you were going to publish this, you would definitely want to play test it a little bit or at least compare it to other things that are out there to get a sense of the numbers. For the most part, the stuff we've published in our games, the numbers more or less work out. There are a couple things I'm going to adjust. Um, like I, I always make my stuff lives digitally for a while so that I have time to adjust it before I take it to a physical form. But um, but for the most part, everything is the numbers and and the the numbers of boxes and things re, more or less like check out. Um, but yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a thing that like from a design standpoint, like you have to like consider you know but for the contest i don't think you really have to worry about it you wouldn't have to worry about that too much um, yeah. any as other comments a, or thoughts yeah yeah as a sort of personal taste uh i typically like having tracks that are divisible by five or two in terms mm. of length just to like make sure it looks good on the sheet as well as like people can wrap their uh, mind around it which is why like I think uh, the Rachel Lee, when I saw the, the Legacy uh, playbook in his early days, it used to have like a track of 13. And I was like, no, you have to like make it like even like 12 or 20 yeah, or that yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that like one thing, like when, when, when you're writing moves, especially these like starting moves that have like these like more, these like complexities and like tracks and currencies and stuff. I mean, I think like it's uh, to some degree, it's better to have less so that the player can control how often they want to engage with it. Like, th like that gives that puts it in the player's hands to decide how much they want to push that button, rather than having too much. Like, I think that the the undeniable's core move has too many boxes because if when it's too much, it's almost like it, it, it saps it of its meaning a little bit and it almost makes it hard to ever achieve the final like marking of the boxes, you know? So I, I think it's better to err on the side of like less than more, um, but that's only something I've come to in recent times. And that just comes from playing the games a lot and, and figuring out kind of what's, what's working and what doesn't work, you know? Um, any other thoughts on Big Top before we move on? Okay, so in that case, let's wrap up with group four and the Dark Underbelly. Gabriel, Corey, either of you want to take this? I can go for it if Corey doesn't want to. Um, <laughs> sorry, just speak over here. Um, we were still kind of messing with the starting move, but uh, I put witness to ruin. Uh, you can perceive what lurks beneath and are brave enough to face it. You can invite another custodian or side character to witness the rot beneath something pleasant or beautiful with you. If asking a side character the truth they witness reveals a clue, tell the keeper what it is. Or if it's a custodian, um, that custodian narrates the horrible truth revealed to them and how it changes something that they believe in. 
um, and that counts as a clue. Um, still kind of messing with that one. Our other moves are the turning worm. When a side character asks something of you or when you wish to influence them, give them a gift. Narrate what beautiful thing you give to them and how it will eventually come to show them the rot beneath. The keeper will manifest this at a later time of their choosing. Uh, then we have the rot within. You can inflict rot and decay with the mere touch. When you do, mark a box below. Um, when all boxes are marked, roll with communion on a 10 plus, you unmark the boxes. Sorry, we just rewrote this, so I'm reading it as we go. On a seven to nine, unmark all boxes, but take the condition rotted. Um, and then on a miss, uh, we had the idea that you accidentally bring forth a saint of rot, and the keeper will describe how it becomes an ongoing danger in a current assignment. Uh, then we have the final prayer, still working on the wording as well, but uh, what rise beneath? You become a living embodiment of rot and spores, oozing insects and wriggling maggots, destroying something beautiful and precious, corrupting it forever. Describes this transformation and how it spreads the rot to others. What irre irreversible truth is laid bare, which future generations will never be able to look away from? And so forth. Fantastic, fantastic. I really like, um, I like the, the second move, especially with that like social component with the side characters. I think that, I think that works really well. I, I view this, I view the possibility for this god and the themes of this god to, um, to be very social in nature. And like, if I was going to like write this one, I would really think about like, how side characters and communities are affected, right? Especially because the custodians like travel into communities, you know, and like, and and so when you have this, you have this player character whose whole thing is, you know, you have the custodians who are generally trying to like help these communities, but then you've got this one that like knows what's really going on in the community. I think that's fun. I think those are those are really, really fun elements. The social elements I think are fun. Uh, love the final prayer. The final prayer is super, super cool. Uh, any other thoughts on the dark underbelly from anyone? Yeah, go ahead. Amanda. Well, when we were writing it, we also were trying to, I mean, we didn't really specify this, but I think we were all on the same page. We were trying to leave it a little bit vague as to what was being like rotting away. Was it people? Was it communities? Was it a physical thing? We wanted to keep everything a little bit on the vague side so that the person who is playing the character can really work with it in their their own story and their own narrative uh well yeah and i think that like there's a you know it's a balance right because uh, to some degree like the cfb playbooks and stuff th there to some degree their strength is specificity right like that specificity you get like say in the american or like in uh you know um you know like the mother right like 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 things like that like there's this like like it's 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 a it's a question of like breadth versus depth you know and so you do have to always strike that balance of like okay i, I can really really hem the playbook in or the faith sheet in and 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 have much more specific outcomes and specific through line to things but i but as long as i'm support but i should also be supporting the player to go deeper right so like it's a it's a narrow but deep exploration of the character right and i think the way that this this pass that you've taken on this the way you've written it it's it's a more like it's a more breadth versus depth like application and there's nothing wrong with that but it's just it's it's a difference i think in like in like style you know like it's 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 uh it's it's and it's something to keep in mind like for anybody who's considering writing these things in the future you know like scope and like and like that breadth versus width or that breadth versus depth like consideration of of the characters is like a really really interesting thing to uh uh, to think about and ponder, but anyway, I'm kind of getting off track, but go ahead, Gabriel. I uh, just, yeah, one way that if I was continuing to flesh this out, I would explore that through the different moves. So as you get a yeah. feel for the, the breadth and depth of what this is about, then you can have a highly specific social interaction move. You can have a yeah. very weird body horror one, right? and that's, you can kind of exaggerate them a little bit more. Well, a lot will come out in the verse of prophecy and history, that right, too. too. Like there's that part of yeah. it also, right? You know, yeah. but yeah. Um, fantastic. Uh, any other thoughts on the dark underbelly? Okay. Well, in that case, uh, we're going to wrap up the workshop with a quick discussion about journey scenes. So journey scenes, probably more than any other part 
of the gate the game excuse me are um they're like a space to play and we designed them that way if you look at all the different journey scenes that come with the game there isn't like one way of doing it as compared to say odyssey tapes in public access or unseens in the between which are the forerunners of of the journey scene th those have like a really particular structure they work a really particular way and they're and they're resolved in a really particular manner uh, these are not the main thing with the journey scenes is that they just reflect certain big ideas uh so there should be a big theme or idea that's explored in the journey scene. They should be things, the journey, scene, the journey scene should be about things that the custodians might see or encounter in their travels. And I think importantly, there should be some kind of narrative progression. Because one big way that the journey scenes are different from say the unseen is the different prompts are visited over the course of multiple sessions, right? And multiple journey phases. So we might only see the first part of the wirebitten child, and we may not see the second part of the wirebitten child until like three sessions later, right? So these are really meant to be kind of like a way of showing a progression. So the next time we see the wirebitten child, we see how what we learned in the first prompt has like deepened and gotten more horrifying or gotten or explored the idea in a deeper way. And then they eventually like lead to this sort of like final kind of big revelation or, or gnarly outcome usually in the case of, of the wire bitten child um, at the end. Right. So that's, so that's the thing. So, but, but there's no real way these have to be structured with the exception of there should be a paint the scene question and there should be recall a time prompts. And we can talk about those in a bit. But otherwise, these can be journey scenes can be like like the roadside diner where there's lots of different options and they all work the same. But every time you travel, you visit a different diner or it could be it's one location visited multiple times. It could be one type of thing like the roadside shrine. And so every time you visit a shrine, you do these same prompts, but it's just different shrines. There's a lot of different things you can do there. Um, I know Gabriel had a lot of thoughts about like like about playing with the journey scenes and like what to do with them yeah there's still some experimentation i want to do so what you got in the release is as far as i got with it um but in addition to the the you know structure that jason mentioned you could also think of journey scenes as events that happen on the road so i've thought of things like you know a radio broadcast that's huge in the show um some festival on the side of the road some disaster, some just like one-off events. You could definitely have some that aren't progressive as well, that are maybe more dramatic. Um, that could be journey scenes um, that are more, I don't know if it's too out there, but it could be like a dream you have. If, if your custodian falls asleep on the road, um, it could be a very private one. Because also uh, the custodians can do the journey scene solo. There's rules for that. So there could be some that are much more some of them lend themselves to that. Like the shrines can be a very like personal thing you encounter and interact with. Um, there's also in the conspiracy, there's a special journey scene that's a keeper reaction where something, a danger basically is pursuing you and getting closer. So I've got some ideas for um, more like, think of them more as events in addition to just locations. The main idea is that uh, it's a living, breathing world, right? So you're, you're showing that in different ways and you're showing that over time. And I think finally the paint the scene and recall a time prompts are meant to echo each other. So in the way that good, you know, fiction does and the show does the, the themes are riffing off of each other. You're seeing this weird dig and construction site where something horrible is being unearthed. And meanwhile, what does this remind you of what's in your past that you would rather left buried, that kind of thing. Um, so I have a couple other upcoming journey scenes and in, in the next conspiracy that involve more like events you could have side characters show up to interact with you yeah. pretty much anything that could fit in between that investigation mode and just be out there in the world and encountered could be a journey scene yeah david do you have some thoughts yeah no i mean i was just just thinking kind of following on what from what you said um uh, gabriel i really like the idea of um maybe even some journey scenes that are kind of like uh, you know kind of like generic road trip type things it's like oh you know you have to change a tire or you know those sort of things where you can kind of have a 
just a very kind of personal moment that isn't like this big like the the the, the wider themes beyond the game but it's just this the, the a moment of bringing the two um characters together that are engaging in that journey scene and stuff like that i think um uh that that, that was just something that occurred to me and i thought i'd, I'd say it while i while i still remember it but yeah yeah in some sense i have this in the later, a little later in the notes but in some sense the journey scenes are almost like a chance to in some sense like almost step away from faith for a minute right like it's an opportunity to kind of like detach just a little bit from from faith from the bureau from the assignments um and and really kind of go really internal with the character by going really external with the world right like it's 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 like it's like world building that is also character backstory building which i think is really fascinating and it's why i think they work in play this is the part of the game design that we probably spent the most time on in terms of getting it right and figuring out what it needed to look like and i i like what we settled on because i think it gives us the most space to like i said to play and to do world building and to explore ideas and to explore them in a way that is not disruptive of the core gameplay loop right and that's really the key thing you, your, your journey scenes you have a lot of room to play precisely because it's in a separate phase that does not affect the core gameplay loop of investigating assignments and resolving assignments right and so um and so there's there's space to to really have some fun there and to do some cool things now as we've noted there's a lot of space as gabriel said there's a lot of like experimentation going on and you should do experimentation in your in your submissions as well here's another area where i think creativity is going to be the the bigger uh, uh judging criteria right um had that said all of the published ones and presumably the ones that you're going to submit for the contest should have paint the scene prompts and recall a time prompts these are the this is the consistent detail across all of them and i'll give you a very fast primer on paint the scene um, I have talked about it in a million other places. It's a technique that I started developing back in 2016, and it's ended up in my game and lots of other people's games uh, since then. And the idea behind Paint the Scene is it is a question posed to the players, or one player sometimes in the case of the journey scene, the question posed to the players that in the answering of the question, we explore an idea. So it's really important for paint the scene that it's not just visual it's not just set dressing we're not just asking you what do you see and hear and feel from a sensory standpoint we're asking what is the idea tell us about this idea of this place as well and so in the answering of that question you should one the answer should tell us what it does look like at a basic level but two what is it about this place that we want to explore? And the outcome at the table, and the reason why I think it's such an effective technique, is it creates player buy-in. The answering of the question creates a space for everyone to get invested in the scene, and it helps sort of merge everyone's head canon and theater of the mind for what this location or this space looks like, right? We're all kind of collectively together getting on the same page of what this place is like. And it makes the scene feel more real and more lived in. So I'm gonna do paint the scene just to give you an example. There's plenty of examples obviously in the in 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 the materials of the game. But I do think that um, I kind of like the I, I love like a fantasy example because we're all really familiar with fantasy gaming, right? Most of us are anyway. And so, my favorite paint the scene that I ever did <laughs> was uh, in a game of Dungeon World. I asked the characters were exploring uh, this villa belonging to a Medusa creature, or like a gorgon, and I asked, "What do you see around here that tells you this is the villa of?" A Medusa. And it was a great question because everybody at the table knows at a basic level what a Gorgon or a Medusa does, right? But, and, and they, they're able to use that sort of like built in knowledge of Medusas to then, well, paint the scene. And so we got answers like, well, all of the mirrors are covered up by heavy cloths, or there's lots of stone statuary around the place, or the owner of this villa really loves snake motifs. There are snake banister railings and snake crown molding and all this other stuff, right? And and so we're building up this like 
story of the place, but we're also fundamentally confirming that this is the home of a Gorgon, right? And so um, that's a simple sort of fantasy adventure example, but that's the idea. You can go into more emotional territories and more emotional or even psychological ideas that you explore through visuals, right? So another great sort of uh, thing, you might have like a paint the scene that's like, what, as you look around this house, what do you see that shows you this family was deeply unhappy? Well, now we're getting into like deeper, more emotional territory, right? So maybe you describe, oh, um, I see like, I see like a, a bit of wall that's been busted in because somebody threw something at it. Or I see, uh, you know, um, I see uh, like, Oh, what else might might show that the family's unhappy as you're looking around the house? Oh, maybe maybe like there's um, there's no pictures of the family members, right? Like 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 there's there's not that kind of like warmth and affection, right? Whatever. The point being though, the idea can be something that's more emotional in nature, right? That's explored, but it's it's this connection between question leads to visuals, leads to exploration of the idea, and so that's what paint the scene is. Um, and then the recall of time is a new thing that we've added for, for, for TSB, but essentially this is a prompt that should inspire conversation between the custodians, right? Because the custodians are, if they're together, they're going to have a scene together, right? And, uh, and that's kind of what we're here to do. We're here to also learn about the custodians and see how they interact with each other while they have some downtime. If it's a solo custodian, maybe the recall of time inspires a little moment of reflection for that custodian. Um, when you're thinking about your journey scenes, you can always return to your theme or big idea. Uh, and that helps with recall of time as well. And try to pose questions or prompts in recall of time that are not considered on the verse of history or prophecy. And the reason why I put that note there is because this is a chance really to learn more about the custodian, but from a slightly different angle, right? It's a chance to learn about the custodian, not through the lens of their faith, not through the lens of this horrible job that they've been pressed into doing, um, but but through some other lens. And so I think it's a it's a great opportunity to do that as well. And so, alas, <laughs> and finally, we have reached the ends of my the end of my outline. Uh, we have about like seven minutes left officially on the call. Uh, I am going to stick around for a little bit after we're done uh, to talk about individual uh, submissions if anybody wants to. But at this point, does anyone have any questions about uh, journey scenes or really anything that we've talked about in the workshop that they want to ask or a thought they want to share? I do have a question about the contest. Mm -hmm. um, so. I personally struggle writing flavor text and like world building stuff. Like when I go through the chat and I see, you know, people with their submissions and they'll have like these, you know, beautifully, you know, written prose about the description of their God. And I, and I literally just only have two sentences, like the green <laughs> yeah. God, the, the God is asleep. It fucks with your memories. Go. Yeah. And I, I like I'm trying not to compare myself to others too much because I know it's not helpful whatsoever. But I'm wondering, like, I'm gonna do my best. Don't worry, I'm gonna do my best. But how much will I get doxxed in, uh, in that angle? I mean, it, it, here's the thing: it's pretty subjective, right? And the judges have three judging criteria: quality of writing, creativity, and playability. And I have given the judges all my interpretation of those three things. And, but ultimately it's pretty subjective and I don't think there's going to be like actual, I mean, they're going to come up with their own system for ranking them all. That's up to them. Um, but in the past, in the past, quality writing has weighed pretty heavily. Uh, Gabriel is a really good writer and he's won a lot of the contests that we've run in past years, right? Um, that said, we have had entries that have won or placed because their ideas were just so good, right? Like where there was just fundamentally such a cool idea that it was so great. And furthermore, even if your entry is not the best written entry, if it catches uh, particularly Alex's eye and my eye uh, for some reason, and it's something we it looks like we can work with, 
um, no matter what the quality of the writing is, if we like the idea, we might approach you about publishing it and then we'll clean it up and make the language the way we want it to be to meet our, our in-house standard as far as that goes. I think you should try. Uh, you should no, try. I mean, to, I'm definitely going to try. Yeah. I'm definitely going to try. Yeah, but, you should like, try. I, I will. Yeah. I will put some effort. Yeah, you should try. I, don't worry too much about other people. Um, a sparse writing style is not a bad writing style. I mean, some of the best writers, uh, like uh, Zedek Su, who writes OSR modules, fabulous OSR modules, with paragraphs that are like one sentence or sentences that are just a few words, but it's well chosen words that are punchy and to the point and they paint a picture. So verbosity is not necessarily the standard here. Uh, I think the standard is, is uh, did I feel inspired by this? Like, did I read this and feel something, right? I think that's the standard. So, um, but it, it will be judged, uh, but it's, but it's, you know, um, but certainly, uh, certainly, Creativity is also a big part of it, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, Ray, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to uh, kind of get general thoughts on uh, scope for journey scenes, right? Mm -hmm. So the two that come to mind are The Wirebitten Child and Who Wants to Be an Avatar, where there's a, a very distinct progression. And just by the, the, the context of Who Wants to Be an Avatar, the custodians don't really have any input on how that shakes out right uh, aside from a narrative like the prompts piece they're not going to go stop their assignments no, and go yeah, deal with no. this so i was wondering about like as we're opening up the possibilities of journey scenes what are some thoughts or or even cautions to avoid it from being a distraction as opposed to inspiration i think it should be a clean division between journey phase and investigation phase that's why there are the phases um i don't think you should leave a lot of room for the custodians to abandon ship and go rescue those poor people on who wants to be an avatar right and, and those those poor people um but uh but that's my thought on it that's not necessarily the right answer that's just my thinking i don't know if anybody else has any thoughts also um i will say we're getting close to the time so if anybody has to bail uh please go ahead uh i'm very happy you came and um once we're done here with the recorded part, I am going to take a short break and then come back for an unrecorded part where I'll just hang out and answer questions about your entries, if you wish. So, uh, but but for the next few minutes, if you have to go, uh, thank you for coming. I hope you got something out of this. Um, uh, but yeah, my, that's my thinking. Ray is is I I think they should there should be a pretty clean division. Um, but but you know it kind of depends. Like the escape test subject, they're going to eventually confront that, right? I mean, so it just kind of depends. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a good counter example, right? Where one that directly intersects yeah. their path. Yeah. Yeah. Right, cool. Thank you. Uh David, did you have a question or a comment? Uh mine was yeah, the yeah, the, the more of a comment thing. Um I was just sort of thinking earlier, um, and just I'm running up again now is um I think when it for, for me, I think I've I've written a, a couple of playbooks for the between, not fully published yet, but um and I think for me, one of the things with like moves and stuff like that that helps um, is to kind of focus on that sort of like, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle type mindset where it's like, look at what's already used by the game and and work out how to, to fit that into the move rather than trying to add on separate, mm -hmm. um, you know, separate mechanical bits and pieces it's like if you can do something by saying add add an item to the altar do that it's a much easier than saying oh once per session here's a whole new thing circumstances do. Yeah. do this it's yeah. like you just go yeah. no just just give them this thing um and and i think that's for me that's one of the, the things i've i found has helped me to kind of get get like playbook moves a bit more focused is just by going how can i incorporate what already exists into this particular i agree menu. completely and when i dev edit them for ones that we're going to publish that other people have written, that's one of my main considerations. It's like, I love where you went with this creatively, but honestly, we can handle this with conditions and 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 alter items, right? Like we don't have to go into all these other like new fangled techniques and stuff. So that's that's a good point. You know, there's there are a lot of buttons to press on the character sheet already, right? So yeah. Uh, chaotic. In terms of like uh, what Brian was saying earlier about like struggling with prose, like I I find that, yes, it's hard to write evocatively compared to like what a lot of people here uh, to note that a lot of people in the gauntlet are 
their own published uh, people in their own rights. So like, it's important to realize like these people write academically, these people write fiction, these people have published their own games. So like, there's a lot of tough cookies here, but I find one of the things that helps me expand upon my ideas is to ask myself, how would I present this at the table that a player would ask me about like the scene and they would ask me for more detail about like, hey, what does this mean? What does it look like? What does it feel like? What does it taste like? Uh, how, like, like playbooks have their own tastes, like their own chewy material, like, like, uh, like the uh, wax and scrivener, like it is like, it starts out with like this very noble cause, but they think it's a little bit sinister because through this destructive element to it, there is a taste. You can taste the paper, you can taste the wax. Uh, so I, 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 like, I don't have anything else to add to that, but it's just a, it's just a taste feature. Yeah, Run and cheap. also, who knows? You might you might be a really good creative writer. You just don't realize it, right? Like, I mean, the very first thing I ever wrote of like this was Brindlewood Bay, and you know, and I was in my forties, so you know, like you just you never know. Like, and I had I didn't I didn't see it coming, and it just it it happened. So you know, you never know. It, it, you might be better than you think. So. I I appreciate the words from Kurtz, but I just suffer from chronic um, no. imposter syndrome. No, absolutely, um, I get it. Yeah, I no, no, I I play Among Us, and I'm like, yeah, that's just me. <laughs> that that's just me <laughs> okay um so we are at the end of the time um so at this point i am going to take a five minute break i'm gonna stop the recording i'm gonna take a five minute break i'm gonna leave the zoom up uh when i get back in five minutes if you're still here i assume you have questions about your entries that you want to talk about and i'm happy to uh talk about them uh, if you have links to your drafts that is most helpful so um uh, be ready to share those and uh, and I'll hang around for probably like 30 minutes or so talking to anybody who wants to get feedback. So uh, I'll be back in five.